Iwagumi is a Japanese style of aquascaping, where each stone within the aquarium has both a name and a specific role to play. This specific style arrangement within an aquarium is one of the inspirations for Gris environment design. Roger Mendoza told The Verge they wanted to give a feeling of loneliness without making it look boring, so they used some Iwagumi aquarium style as an inspiration on that initial area. The feeling of loneliness in Gri uses both this aquarium style as well as Conor Rosé's style to convey the setting in which Gri plays out. Such a world that was emotional and vibrant ripped away from her after a tragedy. The theme of loss is prevalent in Gri, and its usage of color copies the design of Iwagumi. Much like how each stone has its role, each color has its place and its meaning. Nomada's studio is located in Barcelona, Spain, in an artistic neighborhood called Gracia. Adrian Cuevas and Roger Mendoza met at university while Roger was studying and working at Ubisoft in Montreal. He told Adrian that he was having a good time up there and invited him up to work with him. Upon returning to Barcelona after working in Montreal for a while, they continued to work at their local Ubisoft. Later on, at one of their mutual friends' birthday parties, they met Conrad Rosé. Conrad had a game idea. Now, this idea was one that Rosé had upon seeing a pencil drawing done by a friend of his. A game that would start in gray, or gris in Spanish. You can probably see where I'm going with this. The scope was to be kept small, with ideas too large for them to handle were squashed early on. Gris was released on December 13th, 2018. Gris is a story about a girl that experiences a traumatic moment in her life. She tries to sing out when she wakes in the palm of a statue, a statue that is very quickly crumbling. We quite literally begin with her life falling apart, her safety, her security, all being torn away from her, leaving her to tumble into the void on her own. What starts in color and emotion is torn away as she is dropped into a world that has neither. As she lands, the only color is her significantly dulled blue hair, with the world around her being reduced to black and white. And this is the first stage, both of the game and of grief. This is the first experience happening directly after the loss of a loved one. There is a difficulty accepting the reality of the situation, but denial allows us to escape from the overwhelming pain that is being felt after such an event. What we see normally completely changes, as both the environment and even oneself lose their color, their spark, their glow. Bright things become dull, activities that were previously exciting become unenjoyable. Things seem, overall, hopeless. The healing process, and continuing on in the stages of grief, only begin when she is given a bright light in her darkest time, which allow her to bridge gaps that she could not previously cross, both figuratively and literally. This moat is the thing that pushes her forward, and this can be plenty of different things that vary from person to person, but the most common one is time. When the numbness finally fades, the first emotion to return is usually... Red comes back to the world. Not all at once, but it explodes back into being, splashing a monochromatic theme all over the canvas, with the entire world becoming colored again. Just not as it used to be. Stone, sand, the sun, birds in the sky, all of it is red of varying hues and tones. It starts soft, but as Grease slides down a dune into the desert, the red becomes deeper, more vibrant, more passionate. This is also the first level where the dress upgrades are given to the player, and everything has a meaning. The first one lets you turn into a block. It lets you hunker down, shut yourself out from external factors, as well as letting you lash out, breaking things. While this is limited to statues and rocks here, throwing things with the intent to break them, 
or just smashing things is usually a result of an outburst of this emotion. Being angry at a loss brings with it a fear, and rage as a reaction is much more common than thinking through these emotions or admitting that fear. After breaking through several floors, the red goes from a darker red back to black and white, in an area filled with statues reminiscent of the one that was started in. Just because there's a relative forward order for grief, it's still possible to backslide. They aren't locked in place, the stages of grief. There's an ebb and flow, and while sometimes stages can be skipped over, more often than not, they go backwards. As you break things in your anger, each attempt at breaking throws more fragments of grief into the mirror image of your psyche. This is essentially, for right now, hitting rock bottom. Before Gree is sent back upwards to where she was beforehand, the level goes from a blistering desert, climbing upwards the entire time, heading away from the sand and the deep crimson tones, to a lighter, pinker tone. It's still red, it's just reimagined. There are windmills, the clouds, it's... there's not really any more of the dark red that we've been used to the entire time. After she climbs, she goes through several windmills, she finds another broken statue and jumping over to it, Gree starts. The second hand brings a life back to the world, this time green, exploding forth. It becomes a dominant presence, yes, but the red hasn't gone away. This is important to make note of, as the stages of grief are less of a one at a time type thing. They're more of uh, having all of them present at the same time, just whatever stage you're at is currently in charge, or the one most felt, hence the dominance of the color scheme in its respective level. Red is still in everything and still present, but lighter, muted, less of a forefront. The forest is majority green, but the trunks are deep, near brown shades of red, still present, but leaves are untouched green. Upon meeting a forest friend filled with joyous whimsy, Gree is led into a cave and given another upgrade to her dress, which gives her a double jump. So this is another way that we try to change ourselves to move past that which hurt us so badly, and to move to different places, moving upwards through paper butterflies, a creature often associated with change. After soaring into the sky on the wings of hundreds of butterflies, the entirety of grief shows up once more as a massive blackbird. Just as Gree is finally rising up through the clouds, grief can change and grow stronger. An interesting thing to note about this boss fight is that the green is pretty much completely gone while the red takes over again. Anger, frustration and feeling like she's slipping backwards, but after grief disappears and the fight is won, the green is back to where it was previously. But there's still a little red tinge over everything as the anger fades. She goes up, 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 up to a statue missing the top of its head. This statue is the most complete so far and its resemblance of a woman is obvious. A memory of someone. Blue comes back, it begins to rain, and Gree starts to experience. Blue floods into the story, and everything becomes violently cobalt. You can sort of see the previous colors, but the blue is formidable, overwhelming. I really enjoy the level design here, because after starting at the highest point of any of the levels thus far, going through the forest, which is now changed, covered in blue, remade with rain, and then going deeper, further down than ever before. You start at your highest and you go to your lowest. The slopes go down, down, down. Then just when you think you can't go further down, there's water. You sink into the abyss, into your depression. It's overwhelming. It gets so blue that it's black, even more hopeless than the very beginning of the game. This is... this is one of the stages that most people get stuck on for the longest time, as the void is so incredibly hard to escape. 
After collecting a good amount of motes, giving them to the giant pink turtle and swimming down into the void together, only to have to continue on your own, you plunge into the deepest dark, only to come out the other end unscathed, finding the first full statue at the absolute deepest you've gone, and this is the last major stage of grief. Grey still cannot sing. Horrid black tendrils come from the void, cracking the full statue. Capsulating Grey before she makes her escape. It then taking after her, first as a bird, then something more suited for the water they dive into. A massive eel. This is the worst backslide yet. Grief rearing its ugly head just as the cycle is coming to a close. The chase is wholly blue and black, with only minuscule amounts of colors here and there, growing darker the longer it lasts. She is swimming for her life in near pitch darkness. But it, it does have lights in the darkness, literally. These tiny bioluminescent flora that show you the way to your salvation. Not enough to be incredibly obvious. There's not an arrow or exclamation point pointing you to where you need to go. But the closer you get to finding the help you needed, the more frequent the plants are. They're soft, glowing yellow, and you just kind of think in the back of your head in your panic, as you swim as fast as you can, away from the horror trying to swallow you, that it'll be okay. Right before the end, as grief threatens to swallow you for the last time, your story ending, something comes back to save you. The hope of improvement, the hope for something better. And while it's not incredibly obvious in the dark, grief is swimming away from the eel in a mostly upwards way. There were some turns where she went back downwards, but overall, she was rising out of her own personal abyss, and distancing herself from the darkest place that she had been in. After hope returns, the eel is vanquished, seemingly, and then begins the climb back out of the void that she had been stuck in for so long. The blue gets brighter and brighter, until you're back at the beginning 
Getting out of the abyss with the turtle, Hope, it's it's a pretty emotional moment for me. And as Gree retreads all of her previous steps, experiencing what she missed before when she was depressed, and before the acceptance had shown up in the form of light and yellow, she has accepted her loss. She can begin to climb out of that pit. And she does. And after finally returning back to the hub, having defeated the largest form of her grief to date, and accepting the loss, Gree climbs to the city in the sky, wreathed in every color that we've seen thus far. The blue is still the main focus. Like how red was reused for passion, this blue is more of a restful insight than a depressive abyss. Things are kind of back to normal but there's something sort of wrong. If you pay attention, most of this entire level is upside down, despite the climbing into the sky thing to reach it. I like the idea put forth by this interpretation that rather than our experiences shrinking, we grow around them and learn how to better deal with them, but it doesn't go away. The loss is not ignored, it's just taken into one's character and it allows us to embrace the present instead of the past though the past never truly leaves her good. By accepting and processing her loss, Gree is able to sing once more. This brings back the vibrancy to the upside down city in the sky, and as she makes her way through it by feeling the full spectrum of her emotion again without the knife of loss in her heart, she ascends to the sky, singing out all of her pain, and turns the world right side up again. Everything post-acceptance is the stage when things go back to normal, whatever that may be now. Gree can now see the world as it's meant to be seen again. The very first event after Gree turns the world right side up is grief showing up in the biggest form that it has been again. A horrible ink black creature as a terrible mirror of Gree herself. This time, grief just takes all the color from the world around her, and the next sequence is sickeningly close to the beginning of the game. She swims up through the inky blackness, and the tomb of her lost loved one is here. This is the foil for her relapse. 
Gree, after taking a moment with the tomb, she ascends the crumbled bits of one last statue. back, first to the palm and the statue, then the entire world. Everything is more vivid. Statue sheds one tear for you as a last goodbye. The game is over. This chapter for Gree is over. But her life is not. She will grow around this experience and become who she is to be. I, I don't know what I would say to those that I've lost if I could get the chance. I haven't written up anything for that, you know, ironically, compared to how much I wrote for this. But Gree, as a piece of artwork, not just a game, is an experience that makes me feel like I got some closure because I was able to play as someone who could. I don't know too much about music, honestly. Uh, I played the flute in 5th through ninth grade, and sure, I was okay at it, but that's at best. What Berlinist, consisting of Marco Albano, Luigi Gervasi, and Gemma Gamara has done here is nothing short of incredible. I was listening to the soundtrack again while writing this out, and I was feeling emotional at points, even without the story that the music accentuates. The music was used in such a way that it only ever increased what you were already feeling. The strings and the piano allowed you to feel stuff, emotions, and I don't know how they were able to properly put such melancholy into a soundtrack without going too far overboard on any aspect of it. It thoroughly impacts the game for the better, and I could not imagine Gree without such a powerful accompaniment. Gree has one ending, this is true, but there is a hidden cutscene if you collect all of the mementos, uh, this version's game of a collectible throughout the levels. When I first started writing this whole thing, I think that I vaguely knew it existed, 
but I didn't know what it was. No spoilers going in was insane. I figured if I was going to talk about Gree, I want to talk about all of it. So I 100%ed the game, and let me tell you, after all the meat and potatoes of the game, I wasn't expecting an emotional gut punch at the finish line. It puts everything into perspective. The identity of the statues, everything that was being alluded to but not explicitly told. In case you would like to be like me and not know what the specific bit is about so you can get it for yourself, I'm gonna have a timestamp somewhere that's after this whole section. I'm going to just play this secret on its own, unedited, without me talking over it like I have been for the rest of the game so you can have the full emotional impact of it and then I'll like talk about it afterwards. So here it is. So you remember all of the lights that you've been collecting throughout the game that allow you to bridge gaps, overcome your troubles, the moats, the ones that gave you access to your power-ups, your ability to change, adapt, overcome, and the ones that lit up your hope in the turtle to save you from an eel? They were all given to Gree by her mother, who is in fact the woman in all of the statues their memories, mementos of her mother, connecting to, to her love of the woman who raised her and the experiences shared. I like to think of these in real terms as things that remind you of people that aren't there in your life anymore, but just a small portion of them. Like a song that your ex showed you, their favorite color, a smell, you get the idea. These mementos that you collect throughout the game are that exact same thing for Gree. She's reliving all of these memories while trying to deal with not having that person anymore. And that hurts. Gree was a game that I got on a whim. I can't say I was a day one backer, a rabid fan, or anything like that. It was just another game published by Devolver Digital, who I enjoyed for Hotline Miami, Enter the Gungeon, and then I came across Gree. I thought it was gorgeous, sure, and then I got it on sale, and I didn't really know what to expect aside from overwhelmingly positive reviews. Whatever expectations I had were blown out of the water. I can't say I know the pain of losing a parent, but I've definitely had people that I thought would be in my life for the rest of my life, and now I can't speak to them ever again. Gree was, and is, a beautiful experience that tackles deeper psychological concepts without having to use any of the words that might detract from the point. And I think that's an incredible feat by Nomada. I think this is a truly unique experience. I'd say that Hollow Knight was probably the closest that I've come to a game like this. Not in gameplay or game design. I mean, sure, they're both platformers in a way. But just in the power of emotionality without using one's voice. The main character in both is Mute. Hollow Knight was a game that beat me down for 20 hours. And there was just this moment that, like, solidified it for me as fantastic. There was a lake, and you could just sit down at it, at the edge of the lake, 
there's a guy there, a mentor-like character that has been with you the entire game, and you can just sit with him. It doesn't progress the story, it doesn't get you a cool weapon or anything, like, it's just a moment. And it was powerful. I cried. Because it was just this quiet moment in the middle of it all. Because Hollow Knight is a hard game. It does not pull any punches. It is, it is rough. And just this quiet moment with a perceived friend. Just in the middle of all that. It was incredible. And I realize that Gree is still a game that I find difficult to fully explain. Even at the end of a whole video on it. I still don't know if I properly conveyed how important I believe it to be. I initially made a PowerPoint on this for a class in 2D design and color theory. And this thing was just an expansion of that idea after I kind of decided to make a video essay one day. The end of the game, the perseverance, and the overall experience is something that I'm eternally grateful for Nomada for providing. And I knew that making a project on it would give me the first real opportunity to speak about it at length. Artistry is incredibly important to me, and this was one of the more surreal artistic pieces that I've experienced. Period. Gree is something that I held near and dear to my heart ever since I first played it in December of 2020. You may notice that this video is, in fact, not uploaded in 2020. While, I know. Gree just sort of has that lasting effect, where you think about it for a while, like a good show that sort of sinks into your bones and ruminates there for the longest of times. I played through the whole thing four or five times, not counting individual levels to finish off the achievements, just because of the 100%ing it for credibility, I guess. It's hard to think of a good enough line for closing this video out, honestly. It's been rattling around in my skull for the longest time, and I've only recently started to think up what I'd like to say past the maybe one or two paragraphs that were in the college presentation. This is obviously so much more than that, because Gree is so much more than that for me. I realize that I sound like a broken record at this point, but at least we got to the end of the album. To face one's sorrows and troubles, and to come through them stronger, the struggle, I would like to know what comes next. Just like Gree.